Hello and good evening. I think we've gone live with Doc Spot right now. So today we are in conversation with uh, Mansi. Uh, hello, Mansi. So let me begin Hi. with introducing you to our audience. Mansi Saha is a holistic wellness practitioner. Uh, she is the founder of Doggy Dishes. She holds a canine nutrition diploma from the British College of Canine Studies. She's also done the following courses, which is the Canine Essentials 101 from Bangalore Hunda School, a natural healing nutritional workshop by Helen Moore. Helen is a holistic nutritional practitioner in Toronto, Canada. She's attended a workshop with the Garland team during their visit to India. Uh, it uh, taught her a great deal about uh, the gait in dogs and about pain that dogs have. She took part in the brand new Barks Canine Essential 101 in 2018. She's a proud member of the International Companion Animal Network, ICANN, which obliges all members to uphold certain standards and ethical practices in their work and their conduct with clients and their dogs. She has pursued her second canine nutrition and holistic wellness diploma from the International School of Canine Psychology and Behavior UK. And currently she's, she is undergoing her uh, England level four accredited diploma back bet with box and a little about myself before we start today's discussion uh, I am a software engineer and all the, the love for all things dogs have led me to barks where I'm currently pursuing my uh, accredited diploma on canine behavior and ethology I have completed my foundation course uh, with garland myotherapy and I am a member of the pet dog trainers of Europe so Hi, Mansi. It's Hi. been a really long time. I'm so glad we're doing this live and because mostly because this, this is such an important topic to talk about, right? So it's about weight management in dogs. So before we deep dive into how we can effectively manage our dog's weight, uh, I'm going to ask Mansi to start off the conversation by giving us some clarity on the difference and, uh, you know, exactly just define what the terms overweight and uh, obesity uh, means. So, what is the uh, what is the difference uh, between obesity and overweight dogs? Um, so, it's uh, it's the same thing, just worse, right? But uh, you have an ideal body condition uh, for your dogs, and then uh, if you go about fifteen percent over on body fat, you are entering uh, overweight stage about 25% overweight on body fat, you're going to be obese. And anything more than that, you're going sort of stepping into morbidly obese. Um, the higher the amount of body fat you're storing on any particular body, the higher your risk of um, diseases and inflammatory uh, chronic pain and diseases increases, basically. That's the uh, risks of it. Um, so okay. obesity- and we have a weight chart which defines that this weight is obese and this weight is overweight uh so that is so traditionally that is how it would be uh, uh portrayed that yes the, there is a chart and that you know if you are this breed then you need to be this much if you're female or male of this breed then you are within this bracket of weight and so on and so forth but it just it isn't applicable anymore i feel because <laughs> Um, our breeds have changed a lot in the last hundred years. Uh, we have had a lot of crossbreeding. We don't have pure bloodlines. We our breeds don't even look like they did a hundred years ago. They've changed so much. Um, so, because of all of that, I feel like the chart that said your let's just take Labradors because they're such common breed in India. A Labrador is meant to be between 25 and 30 if a female and maybe 30 to 35 if male. I'm just throwing numbers. This is not something I'm reading from a chart. I'm just giving an example. Right. Yeah. Um, a, it allows for a very large variation. So if your dog is meant to be 25 and because the chart says between 25 and 30 is okay, you're probably not going to do anything about it till your dog is maybe 32 or 33 because you are thinking up to 30 is okay but if your dog is actually meant to be it's a smaller dog and it's meant to be leaner and meant to be closer to 25 by the time you're 32 you're already 25 percent overweight which means that you're already obese, obese you're not right. overweight anymore 
right? So these charts, I feel like, don't allow for uh, individuality, and they allow for a very large variance. And sometimes they actually allow for uh, overweight or obesity to set in before panic sets in. And then uh, it's a big uphill task of trying to get your dog to lose that weight. It is so much easier to maintain weight than lose weight. It is so much and easier to lose a little bit of weight than a whole lot of a weight. Lot of weight. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and we see that with humans too, right? Like, it's obesity or being overweight doesn't happen in a day, right? It is an ongoing uphill or a downhill process, right? It's not that you wake up one day with 15 kilos weight more put on, right? So it is a gradual process. It's never overnight, although a lot of people will say it. Uh, it's like suddenly my dog is so overweight. It didn't happen suddenly. It really didn't. It happened probably over months or a year or a year and a half. And the quicker you catch it, uh, the better it is for you. Uh, better for your dog, better for you because less effort. Right? If you're only looking at losing, uh, let's say, 5, 6, 7% of your body fat, it's just so much less effort than 30 or 35%. Right, and we've already got started getting questions, uh, uh, you know, about what we are discussing. So I'll take some of the few questions if, a little bit into the live, so because we might be already covering some of those questions. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so talking about what you were saying, like for example, a lab. So there are some breeds, like say labs or pugs. We have this common notion within us that a, a pudgy dog is a cuter dog. So that's the kind of norm that we see. Uh, everywhere right so is it i mean uh, they're just expected to be pudgy and plump and cute and it's just a little bit of a happy go thing so is it any different for different breeds of dogs or different uh, you know ages of dogs or uh, how does it work really um so it's like saying that um well what how do i do it um Maharashtrian girls versus uh, Bengali girls versus Gujarati girls. Right? Yeah. Is it okay for just Gujarati girls to be a little plump and is that better for them? Um, is it un less unhealthy for them because somehow they look cuter because they're plump? Uh, you see how strange that sounds? It does, <laughs> you know? Start yeah. putting it in, uh, you know, change. Um, you know, Labrador and Pug and uh, Indies into these words. It just it sounds ridiculous almost. So uh, no, an ideal body condition score or an ideal body condition for any dog is pretty much the same. Uh, not that they all meant to look the same, but the criteria or the, um, um, so basically the pointers on which we would measure uh, would be the same for all dogs. Um, right. So let's say a bulldog, which is a stouter dog and a slightly more broader uh, shoulder dog is going to visually look different. But if you did a body condition score on him, which is your touch and feel test, they should feel pretty much the same. And they should overall have a very similar shape to their body, just um, different proportions because it's a stouter, shorter breed. Similarly with a pug, uh, whereas a, uh, you know, your mother hounds or your caravan hounds or a greyhound which are taller, very, very slim dogs are going to look different visually. But again, your markers are going to be the same. Do you have a lot of fat? It's like because they're the built plate? differently. They're built differently. They're vis right. What are breeds? They're basically visually different, right? Otherwise, right. physiologically, all dogs are the same. They're just right. visually right. different. They're still the same species. And so, so their markers about, are going to be the same. When you talk about body conditioning scoring and markers, what exactly is body conditioning scoring? So body condition scoring is you score the condition of the body. And therefore, you're now taking the individuality of this animal into consideration. We are not looking at all the Labradors in the world. We are looking at this Labrador. And we're looking at whether this Labrador is tall or short, how much fat is there around the ribs, whether or not uh, the rib cage is wide and then goes sort of upwards towards the hip bone, whether we have that slant or not, whether or not there's too much fat or a big chunk on the sternum in the front, uh, whether or not you can feel the spinal cord. These are the things that we would check for. Hi, this is Mimi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, these are the things we would check for. Um, 
in a body condition score and we would score the body. Uh, there is okay. an ideal body shape and condition. And the more we deviate from the ideal, either towards the uh, skinnier side, we would go into underweight scoring. And if we go towards the fatter side, where there is too much fat layers where there shouldn't be, and you can't feel the bone where you should be feeling the bone, we are then scoring the body away from ideal on the more overweight and obesity side. So we is there a body conditioning score. chart that we can refer to? Are there numbers yes, there on is. it? Okay. Yes, there is. So you get two types of charts. One uh, chart is uh, uh, one to nine, uh, five being ideal, one to four being underweight, various stages of underweight, and then uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, sorry, uh, six, seven, eight, six, nine seven, eight, being nine. The, yeah. uh, overweight stages, five being ideal, or you get a five uh, point scorer where your three is ideal and you have two underweight stages and two overweight, two stages. overweight stages. So All if right. you just Googled up uh, body condition scoring chart or system or on the Dogalicious uh, website, we have a uh, blog that details how you can do a body condition score with visuals. So you can go ahead, refer to that, follow the step-by-step -step guide and you know do perform a body condition score on your dog every week. Really, so you catch it really, really fast. So this you is you're saying this is something we can do at home, and we don't need to rush to a groomer or a vet to weigh our dog, right? So this is something not I can at do at home for my dog. Okay. Yes, not at all. In fact, uh, once you start doing it on a regular basis, you tend to gain a memory in your hands, and as your dog loses weight, your fingers will know that it's happening. If you have an ideally conditioned dog already. Uh, as your dog gains weight, your fingers will know the difference. Visually, you will know the difference because you're used to now touching your dog with the intent of seeing where the excess fat deposit is getting laid in certain places where it's not meant to be there. So once you start doing it with intent and you start following the steps, your fingers will catch it really quickly. You don't necessarily need to weigh the dog to know this. Right. And so we have a relevant question coming up uh, in the comment section from Durga. She says that her golden retriever is seven years old and she has a uh, 45 to uh, she, she is. I mean, the golden retriever is 45 to 46 kilos in weight. And uh, is he overweight? So I think we have already touched base, but I would just like it, it's just an example. So if you would answer this question for her, I wouldn't know whether her dog exactly. is overweight is right. the answer to this question. She is the best person to know whether her dog is overweight. And the way to do that is get the body condition score blog out, read the instructions, follow them step by step, do the condition scoring on your dog, and look at what the score is. If your dog is scored, if three is ideal, your dog could score a three plus or a three plus plus, which means a little bit. Let's just mm -hmm. get it down as soon as possible. Um, or your dog might score a four, which is an overweight. Or your dog might score a five or a five plus plus, which is a morbidly obese. I don't know for this particular dog whether 46 is morbidly obese or ideal. I really don't know. I need right. to see the dog. But the best person to do that would be her because it's a look and feel. You need to touch the dog as well. Okay. So my next question uh, sounds really relevant, like, uh, so what are the implications of my dog or of somebody else's dog being uh, overweight and uh, what are the short term implications and what would be the long term implications? Because uh, as the discussion unfolds, I feel that it is not really only a cosmetic problem that we're looking at, it might have a deeper implication, right? Uh, very deep. In fact, it's one of the scariest. So obesity or overweight dogs is the single most avoidable low-grade inflammatory disease in the world because it's avoidable. It's not something you get. It's not something you catch. It's not something you contract from someone else and you just have no uh, control over it. It is an avoidable inflammatory disease. Uh, the reason it is categorized as a disease is because it um, breeds, spreads, encourages system-wide cellular inflammation across the body. And when you start getting, when you start storing inflammation across your body, um, you then start giving birth to a lot of other inflammatory diseases. Um, you put more pressure on the heart to pump blood to a larger body than it is designed to pump. 
use. Uh, so blood pressure goes up, heart, the risk of cardiac diseases go up, uh, the risk of uh, strokes go up. Um, so you can end up with any of those uh, breathing problems and uh, oxygenating your blood um, can uh, be a problem because again, your lungs are built for a capacity and now you're trying to oxygenate a much larger body. Um, so breathlessness. Another thing that starts happening is your diaphragm and your lungs can start getting covered with fat. And so your lungs simply don't expand like they're meant to. And so that causes less air intake and therefore breathlessness, therefore uh, lack of oxygenating of the blood. Once all of these problems start off, uh, you're pretty much gi giving way to everything, including cancer, liver and kidney failures, digestive problems, immune system crashes, autoimmune diseases, just about everything, everything. So, so you said uh, that it's an inflammatory response, right? And how does that really work? So fat cells are better at storing inflammation and uh, transmitting inflammation. And when that happens, they're also better at transmitting pain. And so uh, your pain goes up. It also uh, can cause uh, arthritis and worsen the pain of hip dysplasia. So hip dysplasia is a hereditary, as in it's something you're born with. Uh, it's a genetic disorder, uh, but arthritis is something that happens um, as time goes by. You do have juvenile arthritis, uh, which results from hip dysplasia, but either way, it's a very painful condition. And if you have it and you're overweight, it's just common sense that you're loading the joints more than they need to be, and that's a bad idea. But other than that, you will just experience more pain because inflammation will go up simply because more fat cells will mean more inflammation in the body. Oh, okay. And does this have a direct, I mean, I, I kind of know the answer when I'm asking the question, but does this have a direct connection to the lifespan and the mortality of the individual? Yes, mortality is impacted by obesity. Uh, obese dogs will live lesser. Uh, they will have a shorter lifespan than ideally weighted dogs. There were studies right. that were done. We can link the studies to the um, to the talk later. Okay. And uh, while we're on the topic of the different illnesses that a my dog might have, which might result from obesity, can you talk a little bit more about uh, increased pain and arthritis and wh how the, if, what the effect of this is, I mean, in case of uh, the joints of an overweight dog? Um, so it is almost like common sense really that your spinal cord in a in a uh, animal that uses four legs uh the spinal cord is like your it's a bridge with your four legs right this entire structure has a capacity for weight bearing in its optimal sense you start overloading any kind of a structure uh it is going to weaken the structure now if you have hip dysplasia you already have a weak structure if you have now arthritis uh, as a result of hip dysplasia or as an independent uh, disease, it is an inflammatory disease. It is a progressive and a degenerative uh, condition, which means it's only going to get worse. Now you start overloading and you start putting more load and more pressure on, a, on these joints just simply by being fat. You're making your condition worse. You're making your pain worse. You're increasing inflammation. And we are constantly trying to reduce inflammation in dogs that have arthritis or hip dysplasia or any kind of an inflammatory condition because that leads to pain. Inflammation is pain. And so we want to reduce pain in these animals. But if you're going to load the animal up with excess weight, it, it's counterintuitive. It's just not going so to help. All of this it. sounds like a really vicious and toxic cycle, right? That yeah. pain would really influence and, you know, mm -hmm. cause arthritis in a way, and then arthritis would cause more pain. Yes, it right. would. And being overweight will probably impact the way uh, you walk or the way you use your musculoskeletal system, uh, maybe alter gait. Um, that could lead to making arthritis worse or even cause arthritis. Um, so it's a chicken and egg thing, but you know, it definitely makes it worse. So, so when you um, say it would, Im it would impact gait, would you, do you mean that some, uh, an individual might overuse or underuse one of their limbs or one side to, you know, uh, 
stop get being more feeling more pain in that particular body yeah. and that yeah all living beings do it um we limp and we compensate and we shift our weight based on what uh feeling pain in particular joints or particular areas of our body uh if i am feeling pain in any part of my body i'm sort of slightly going to tilt and start compensating by saying okay i'm going to relieve this part but eventually i'm going to start making this hurt because i'm 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 not balanced anymore right so when dogs feel pain towards the rear end of their body they start front loading if they have injured their front they might start loading to the left or to the right um so loading does change and once you start changing the way you load your body you're going to start um weakening the part you're loading on you know uh in order to try and relieve the part that was already hurting you will sort of start causing a uh, secondary pain happening in the part that you are now overusing and that so, kind of makes sense right because that's what happens with us humans too if we have an injury we try to try to not put any weight on that particular limb say maybe a knee or an ankle and then we find out a few months later that the other limb is the one which has which has more pain right because it was yeah. Being overworked yeah. yeah so um this is where um you know really being aware of your dog's uh, gait maybe taking uh, pictures and videos periodically uh, comparing them with each other just to see because some of these changes and some of this onset of pain and changes in gait is so incremental and so tiny and it happens so slowly over time that it it gets normalized in our heads uh, it's very small and incremental so uh, we forget what our dog walked like last year and the fact that it's much worse this year unless we proactively start doing these um you know comparatives uh, pictures or videos of them we talked about proactive and reactive care in one of our uh, lives yeah, last nice. year and uh, again it's about that it's about being proactive it's about looking into what's functional movement um so uh, garland myotherapy um uh, in uk if somebody wanted to check it out they could check out their website uh they they work on functional movement they give you distance support and they uh help you um uh, to decide what kind of exercise might be good for your dog and with pain management they do pain management as well so and uh, arthritis is rampant uh with uh, our dogs in india and we have a lot of dogs with hip dysplasia and arthritis so um cam might be a really good website to check out as a resource for what can be done to uh take uh just help your dog um you know manage pain so cam is canine arthritis management but again a uk uh based website but a really good resource right and then uh i mean let's let's get to the really important you uh, know question then how do we manage weight so what should we do or rather what should we not do so that we don't have an obese dog or we don't have an overweight dog then so if you're asking me about how do we prevent it uh get the dog on a good diet and make sure right. you're not overfeeding okay. your dog um it is it is what goes in what comes out it is a little bit of math um i very rarely see in a dog that has just randomly put on weight that wasn't being overfed or wasn't being fed the wrong kind of food um or a very heavy carbohydrate heavy diet or um typically would be on kibble because that is a carbohydrate heavy uh way of feeding a dog so species appropriate uh, appropriate amount of protein appropriate amount of uh healthy fats and a uh, a fairly low uh carbohydrate diet is um complex that too is a great way to prevent feed your dog right is a great way to prevent your dog from becoming overweight in the first place but if you already have an overweight dog then uh feed right is the only way to actually get your dog back into a good shape is because there really isn't an alternative to this um for decades we were led to believe that uh exercise is the way to lose weight uh even for humans and we are now finding out that that was not true exercise in fact contributes um uh 3 to 5% towards weight loss it doesn't have more value than that at all we are exercising can does add value in terms of 
maybe toning up muscle or uh, building a little bit more muscle, but that really has a place in your weight loss journey after you have lost an, a certain amount of weight already. So as an obese dog, exercising the dog and focusing on what's going to contribute only three to 5% towards weight loss just is very counterintuitive to me because of two things. One, we know that just by being obese and getting obese takes time. So for quite a while now, your dog has had inflammation all over their body um, and probably has pain uh, just because of carrying excess weight as well. We get uh, ankle pain and knee pain if we are overweight and we're carrying that weight for a while. So just by being overweight, uh, your dog is probably got, definitely has inflammation in the system, but probably also has pain. And now you're going to take a dog that's inflamed and is in pain and you're going to make them exercise because you're focused on that 5% contribution because exercise is going to make my dog lose weight. It won't happen. You really need to be focusing on 95% contributing factors, which is diet and recovery. You want to okay, recover. When you say recovery, what do you mean by that? Inflammation. We right. want the body to be recovering from inflammation. If there is pain, we want to elevate some of that pain. And we want, to, we want the dog to start getting lighter. So that when you start making the dog do some functional movement, and I'm really going to stress on this functional movement, guys, please look this up. Making the dog run around mindlessly, fetch, uh, tug of war, uh, just running in the park or doing zoomies at home or God forbid, tying them to your bicycle and making them run endlessly is not functional exercise. It will damage your dog more. So first start, focus on the 95%, which is, recovery and diet get your dog to start losing weight reduce the inflammation in the body hopefully reduce the pain in the body and then we can start doing some functional movement in order to strengthen and build a little bit more muscle mass right so we've got a few relevant questions coming up that i would like to take up so durga is asking that she uh, uh walks her dog uh three to four and her dog walks three to four kilometers a day and um, her dog eats rice uh, I, I mean i think she's asking if her dog could be fed rice or chapati so what would your answer to that be it's very hard to answer a question in isolation like that a rice and chapatis are entirely carbohydrate so if I'm simply asked, can I feed my dog rice or chapatis? I'm going to need so much more information. Is he getting it with animal protein? Is the protein majority? Is there some complex carbohydrates in terms of uh, vegetables in that? Is your rice and chapati in the minority, like maybe 10% of the whole meal? Then yeah, the answer is yes. Sure, go ahead, do it. But if you just say to me, can I feed rice or chapatis? And you, in your head, you mean 90% of the meal is rice and chapatis. And I'm putting one piece of chicken in there or maybe zero meat in there. Then the answer is no. So there's a lot of context to these questions. And it really can't be done like that. My consultations take upwards of three and a half hours to understand what it is you're doing with your dog, for me to understand what's going on in the dog's life and body, and for me to actually give you a plan of action takes me three and a half hours of conversation. So this is a hard question to answer like this. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, uh, the other question as well, that her dog walks for three to four kilometers a day, that's a little bit relevant to our discussion that we had right now, where we said that, uh, intense exercise is not really going to make a, a dog lose much weight because five percent of the contribution in uh, uh, would be because of lack of exercise right so chances are that i haven't seen the photographs of this dog this is the same dog that was 45 or 46 kilos yeah yeah, I um, think so, yes. yeah. unless he's a really large american labrador and is in ideal body condition at 46 kilos, my guess would be that he's overweight at the very best or obese. Um, but I don't know, I'm gonna take a guess. Now let's assume that he is either overweight or obese. Chances are that he is gonna have inflammation and pain already in place because it's, not, it's taken him a while to get here. And I just answered this question two minutes ago, is that in this situation, would I want this body to be worth walking for three to four kilometers? I wouldn't do that to my dog. 
I would focus on diet and nutrition and I would focus on recovery, bringing down uh, inflammation by using the right kind of supplementation and the right kind of ingredients. And then once I have gotten a few kilos off is when I would start with some functional movement and then too, it would not be three to four kilometers. Right. And so if I can't exercise my dog, which because of course, as I mean, as we've discussed, it's not the right way to lose weight or right way to enrich a dog. Right. Then what kind of enrichment can we do? Um, there's a lot of enrichment that can be done within the house. Uh, so COVID has done that a little bit. Right. We've been unable to get our dogs out. And so now that we can get them out a little bit more, we are probably overdoing it a little bit. And I think that has a detrimental effect on their health as well, because um, over exercising muscles is going to increase inflammation. Uh, if you work your muscles into fatigue, it is going to increase inflammation and pain. Right. So it, you are going to get into this really bad, vicious cycle where you're going to just make the body worse. Also, over exercising uh, muscles without adequate nutrition and without adequate rest and recovery actually leads to muscle atrophy, which is cannot explain how bad that could be for your dog's musculoskeletal stability. The right. And there is a difference, right, between losing fat and muscle atrophy. Yes. Muscular right. atrophy is losing muscle mass. And that your muscles are literally the thing that holds the skeletal system together other than your tendons and ligaments but this really sort of strengthens and holds it all together you start losing muscle mass there is comes a time in our lifespan where we don't have enough growth hormone to build muscle like we did when we were teenagers so you really want to keep the muscle you have and do your weight loss in an extremely sensible even if it is slow extremely sensible manner Right. So uh, when we talk about functional movements, like we were discussing a few minutes back, what exactly is functional movements and how does it work in helping a dog out? Um, so like when we go to the gym, right, and um, people, I mean, you can be over enthusiastic about when you go to the gym, but almost always somebody will be following you around for the first week and making sure that you're not taking dumbbells and sort of going crazy with them, right? <laughs> like just all over the place. You're going to hurt yourself and you're going to cause an injury and it's not going to help you do anything good to your muscles whatsoever, right? So somebody is going to be there constantly telling you that the way to do functional movement or, or the way to do it correctly and safely is to have controlled, slow movements targeted movements that you are specifically focusing on certain muscle groups. So when we talk about dogs, uh, mindlessly, again, running around, uh, being on slippery floors, playing tug of war, uh, fetch, these are all uh, non-functional movements. They don't serve a purpose. They're too fast. Uh, chances of injury is very, very high. Um, so the risk is very high of just increasing inflammation. Uh, it's uh, you are very high on adrenaline. It's an exciting activity, so your adrenaline is very high. Uh, if you do hurt yourself, you the dog won't know because it won't hurt immediately. Uh, and so, repeated injury on the same part that you already hurt yesterday um, is also very high increased risk of that. So then you're sort of going into a whole different realm of chronic pain and hyperactivity and uh, lack of sleep, and then therefore lack of recovery. Um, yes, and all of this then circles back to what we discussed before with the cardiovascular issues and the liver failure and the kidney diseases and everything. Okay. It's all this big, it's, it's like this big web of a woolen ball. It's all very, very intricately tied in with each other. And it's very hard to just remove one little strand and say, let's talk about this. The body just doesn't work like that, which is why when we talk about holistic wellness, we talk about it as a 360 degree uh, approach because we have to look at mental well-being. We have to look at environment. We have to look at lifestyle. Uh, so your environment, we're talking about things like slippery floors and playing uh, fetch at home. Your lifestyle, we're talking about what kind of exercise are we doing? How long are we taking the dogs out for? Um, how often are we taking them out for? How much do they sleep? That's part of their lifestyle. 
are they sleeping enough and recovering enough on a daily basis? Um, nutrition is part of what are we putting inside the dog's body? Um, so holistic mental stimulation would be part of holistic wellness also uh, because it burns a lot of calories actually. If you get a dog to sit oh, down and okay. use his brain, it will burn calories. If you get a dog right. to uh, intensively use his nose, it will burn a lot of calories. So there are ways of burning calories without doing mindless, um, um, very hyper movements that increase the risk Could of injury. Results in injury. Right. Yes. Right. An injury at a time while you are already have low grade inflammation throughout the body uh, is also going to heal slower because okay. it's going to compound into what was already there and then your um, recovery process is going to be so much slower because of that. Right. It's, it's complex biochemistry. I really don't want to go into it. But uh, in very simple words, this is what happens. You just keep getting stuck in this really vicious cycle. And at some point, um, we have to break that cycle. And the only way to really sit down and understand how to do it is to have somebody really explain all of this in detail by looking at you and your household and your lifestyle and designing something that is appropriate for you and your lifestyle and your dog. Because at the end of the day, you're the doer. It has to involve you and your home. Right. So right. only that's so, a work the plan. So I think uh, another question that comes to mind is during the pandemic, a lot of us have been staying home and working, right? And the dogs have more access to their humans because we are at home. And we all know that dogs are master beggars, right? We've seen that outside of bakeries and outside of, I don't know, I mean, uh, various places where we've seen our treaties just sit and beg for that one biscuit from that one person they know is going to fall for it and give them that biscuit, right? So uh, when we see uh, that, I mean, I see that with my dog as well, that whenever we sit down for lunch, because we're now having a lot of food, we're snacking a lot more in front of our dogs. We see our dogs in front of us begging for food and we've had this issue where uh, you know that people have complained that their dog has put on more weight because they are because they have been begging more and they've been given more food so how, what do we do about that i don't think many people are going to like my answer but chances are that these people have gained a bit of weight also right okay and like I said, it's about the household, it's about the environment, it's about the lifestyle. And a lot of times when I uh, step in and I take on the wellness of a dog, I invariably end up making the whole household a little healthier. Um, because <laughs> it is about the people at the end of the day. The dog's really not going to the kitchen and fixing himself a snack. He's just not. It is somebody people <laughs> who is usually doing it my dogs have not gained weight in the pandemic right. i have not gained weight in the pandemic in fact we have all lost weight because we were focusing on that um mimi was neutered on the street very very early um and uh, our immediate so she she got pregnant in her first cycle on the street um and she had babies and then post that as soon as she stopped feeding them in two months after having the babies, we got her neutered because she was going to remain on the streets. Had I known I was going to adopt her, I wouldn't have gotten her neutered. But then I didn't know I was going to adopt her at the time and she did get spayed. Um, and that has resulted in a little bit of hormonal disbalance and weight gain, which we have now actually worked on for the last year and a half and gotten her to lose that weight. So again, catching it early um, and working on it uh, targeted and focused on it. So none of us have gained weight. Um, has your dog gained weight during no. the pandemic? Have you? No. It's because you have not, she has not. It's that simple. Okay. And so you're talking about you're talking about how Mimi had gained a little bit of weight after she got neutered, right? So are there any other um, illnesses or or procedures or 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 you know instances where a dog uh, gains weight other than being what other than what we discussed right uh, all this while yes so hypothyroidism can lead to unexplained uh, weight gain and so if you dog there has really been no changes in the way you feed your dog and your dog has unexplained uh, 
steady weight gain or sudden weight gain, um, do get it checked out and get your thyroid levels checked because uh, it can lead to thyroid. Hypothyroidism has a lot of other symptoms that go hand in hand with it, but sometimes they're a little subtle and weight, sudden weight gain is something that can be noticed. So when Mimi started gaining weight after she came home, the first thing I checked was thyroid because I know a lot of dogs who are fed well and healthily and on a high animal protein diet don't gain weight even post neutering uh, or spaying. So um, it is about what we feed the dog. If, it, uh, if we keep an eye on how much and what, it is cost, it, it, there's no given that a spayed and neutered dog has to gain weight. Chances increase because of the hormonal disbalance. So when we do early spaying and neutering, there is a hormonal disbalance that happens in the body. Uh, the sexual hormones are not just responsible for reproduction. Some of them are trigger hormones that are responsible for a lot of biochemical markers and communications that happen. We are not even aware of half of them right now. So, you know, there's millions of uh, biochemical communications that happen within the body. Um, we don't know what all it impacts to remove an entire uh, endocrine system from the body um, that produces these hormones that are needed through the lifespan. So we know that one of the implications is uh, unexplained weight gain. Hypothyroidism has the same thing. Um, I would suggest that if you can avoid it, do not go in for early spaying on your train. Um, wait it out. Give your dog the uh, dog's body the opportunity to really grow up and settle down and then consider doing it. Right. So I actually have a question from one of our audiences. He's, she's asking, how many calories should I feed my pet each day? So is there a broader explanation? I mean, uh, is there a, I mean, is there a way for a person to understand that this is the percentage of animal protein and this is the percentage of complex carbohydrates that I can feed or, or how, how is it? How, how does it go? Again, um, this, uh, question has a lot of counter questions. Um, what dog do you have? How old is he? A male or female? Uh, spayed or not? Um, what is their uh, activity levels? How, how many hours do, a day do they sleep? Have you done a sleep study? Do they have any pain right now? Um, all of these questions need to be answered in order to actually even have the information to calculate cal caloric intake. However, there is again a blog on doglicious.com in the resource section that actually gives you a lot of examples of how you can calculate the caloric intake required for your dog. I've taken Bhatti's example, and I have done it for several, several situations uh, with his body weight. So there are calculations there. You can follow the mathematics with your dog's uh, uh, you know, details in there, and then do your calculations and see what that leads you to have. Um, as far as composition or macros is concerned, species appropriate is um, a high animal protein diet. Um, we basically want complex vegetables in there as carbohydrates and vitamins, minerals, and fiber, because it just has health benefits. Uh, if we can get the vitamins and minerals and the fiber roughage from a natural source, instead of a um, you know tonic in a bottle, the natural stuff is just going to act uh, better. It's going to get synthesized better. The gut bacteria is going to know what to do with it. The blood's going to know how to absorb it, and the organs are going to know how to use it. So bioavailability talks about a substance that is biologically available to the body to do the job it is meant to do. The minute you put replace this natural ingredient with a synthetic one, the body doesn't quite know what to do with it. It will use some of it because it's nature identical, but it doesn't do a good job of using it. Right. And I, I believe the key would again be to be proactive than reactive, right? It's easier to be, uh, you know, mindful and help your dog so that the dog doesn't reach that, uh, that part than to, you know, reach there and lose all of that weight. Yes. I mean, I understand why it would, why somebody would start uh, researching after your dog has become overweight or after your dog has uh, is in severe pain or 
um, has a liver or a kidney problem or has a cardiac problem. I get why somebody would go to Google and say, what do I do to help my dog? And we'll probably end up getting uh, some uh, information on, you know, uh, Weight, lose, lose weight, go to a nutritionist, uh, do a holistic wellness thing. And I get why that's the point at which people sort of start doing their research. But really, that's the reactive way of looking at health and wellness. Proactive really is to know innately that I need to look after health and wellness in order to avoid that situation in the first place. Right. So that's the difference. So we've got another question from Manish who's asking, what is the solution for underweight dogs, especially for the adopted stray dogs? Excellent question. We don't get too many uh, questions on underweight dogs. Uh, a, first of all, since it's an adopted stray, if your dog is consistently remaining underweight despite you feeding them adequately, A, give it some time, right? Uh, malnutrition dogs or dogs that have not had enough food are going to take some time to sort of get enough and then start gaining the weight and then start retaining some of that weight as well. Uh, their metabolism is very, very high because they had scarcity. So give it some time and see whether it actually starts working over a few months. Uh, if it is not and your dog is consistently underweight despite being fed adequately. So first check whether you are feeding adequately um, and then if you are and your dog's underweight, then uh, ex look at parasites. Uh, is there something else that's eating up your dog's food? Uh, is, there, um, is there a malabsorption uh, going on somehow? Uh, can you see any other telltale signs like, um, you know, bad skin and bad hair quality or a lot of excessive shedding? Um, or is your dog just in that teenage lanky phase, right? Because there is a lanky phase to teenagers. And they're just, you know, shooting up on their legs and the rest of it is just skinny and it's that awkward uh, long leg uh, situation. So you really have to look at it as a whole again and in context of what's going on and try and piece it, uh, the information together to see, is this something I need to be concerned about or is this just a phase we are going through? Right. Okay. And one more question we've got from Kamal who says, how much puppy starter is sufficient for a 55 days puppy and how many times we should give? So maybe before we take this question, we talk a little bit about uh, weight or weight management in puppies because we do see a lot of podgy puppies, energetic balls of fur, right? So, and then we could take this question. Right. Um, the first thing that happens when we bring puppies home is that we uh, over engage with them and we get them to start sleeping about 50% of what they were while they were still with the mom and siblings. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times that this happens is not because of bad intentions at all, in fact. Um, a, people don't know what adequate amount of sleep is for puppies and um, they I mean, most people's eyes just pop out when I say it's probably closer to 20 hours per 24 hours for puppies to be sleeping. It's like exactly like babies. They grow and they build their body cell by cell while asleep. So they need to be doing a lot of sleeping. And then what do they do in the rest of the time? They will eat, they will play a little bit um, and they will explore the world around them and be curious and then take in all of this information, pee a little, poop a little, go back to sleep. That's it. Exactly like babies do. That's all they do all throughout the 24 hours. So, um, and they're also polyphasic sleepers. So they're going to sleep in small bursts throughout, which also means they're going to need food in small bursts throughout. We bring our dogs home, our puppies home, and uh, we stop feeding them in the night. And that will, a hungry puppy or a hungry baby is not going to be a well-rested or a well-slept baby. A puppy that's being taken away from its mother and siblings is anyway going to be a little high on anxiety and um, high on adrenaline and cortisol and all of these stress hormones within the body, which is going to impact sleep. And then we are excited about having this new puppy home. So we over-engage with the puppy and we actually want a energetic puppy at home just so that we feel that our puppy is not sick and we chose right. the right thing, right 
So we actually interfere with whatever little sleep the puppy is getting um, by over-engaging with the puppy. All of this just cascades into this horrible spiral of lack of sleep, lack of food, lack of uh, uh, adequate nutrition, um, and just way too much, very adrenalized little body. That's then going to go into a lot of excessive nipping, biting, uh, all sorts of things. So all your puppy problems start with lack of sleep. Right. So then the second common question. Yes. Yeah. So how much puppy starter is sufficient for a 55 days puppy and how many times we should feed? A, I don't know what puppy this is. B, I don't know what the weight of the puppy is. These are relative questions to decide how much the dog should be eating. I actually don't know what he means by puppy starter. Is that the milk formula or is that the kibble that you get for starter? If it is kibble that you're talking about, I recommend zero grams of it, uh, zero times a day. Uh, figure out how you're going to get your dog some real food that's going to put in some real nutrition into their body because this is pretty much like bringing your baby home from hospital and starting them off on a diet of Coke and French fries and McDonald's burgers. Not a good idea. So you want real wholesome sustenance for the body to build itself. You don't throw in junk into the body and say, here, build it, build your body with this. You will build a junk body. It's that simple. So right. my answer to this question is zero. Right. So uh, before we start wrapping up today's conversation, one of the other quite important topics that I would like to touch base on was uh, what about weight management in senior dogs? How, is it a little different from uh, uh, are energetic uh, three, four, five, six year old dogs? And if so, how? How do we do, go about with it? Um, it is a little different in the sense that it will probably be a slower process. Um, also, a slightly more carefully designed process because um, typically by the time a dog is um, eight, nine, ten years old, if the dog has not been um, uh, nurtured with nutrition for all of those years, then we've already started seeing signs of the body sort of falling apart. And then if we have liver or kidney issues already set in place, then the diet needs to be designed a little bit more carefully. Um, if we've already got arthritis in place, then definitely do not over-exercise the dog. Um, there might be cardiac issues in place, so that then the diet needs to be designed based on that as well. So it's definitely a slower process with elderly dogs. Um, also, we're not going to be able to build muscle as easily because their growth hormones are not going to be as easily available in the body as they would in a younger dog. So, you know, um, more careful. You don't want to lose the muscle you have. So again, do not over-exercise your senior dog. Uh, please don't take them out for long walks. And even if the dog seems apparently to enjoy it, there's a whole different talk on why your dog can uh, look like he's enjoying long walks and playing in the park. It really is a whole hour's worth of conversation. We can do that uh, if you guys want, but um, can't get into that right now. So just, yeah, it would be and, different. And then if we, if we can't take uh, our senior dogs uh, on long walks and we introduce functional movement, is there a place or a way to do it at home that you would recommend? So yes, a, first you'll have to learn what functional movement is. You will probably right. have to consult somebody that's going to help you out in what's right for your dog. Like I said, Garland does that. You have distance support um, where they give you programs and a plan of action for six weeks. They do a reassessment for you at the end of the six weeks. Um, um, I am working on uh, getting my center ready in Sajapur Road where we will have a space where uh, functional movement can take place. A lot of mental enrichment can take place. We've got a scent garden for sniffing. We've got some sensory integration equipment that dogs can come and use. So that's in the making at the moment, should be ready in a month or so. But uh, yes, so first find the right professional, then get the right advice and then get your dog to start doing it slowly, incrementally, because pain, weight, 
inflammation, none of that happened overnight. It was all incremental. So we're going to do it the reverse incrementally and slowly with a lot of patience and tender loving care is the only way to do it. Perfect. So just a, just one last question that I have. So for our audience, if they want to reach out to you for weight uh, management consults, how do they do, do that? Um, so um, the website is on the um, uh, screen at the moment. You can go on there and there is a tab for consults. I do two types of consults. One is a group and one is uh, a private. You can select whatever you want to do. And um, the difference is clearly stated there. But we actually have a weight management special uh, group consult that we planned for the 14th of August. Um, and it uh, starts at 9 a.m. So it will be a group uh, situation. Everybody in that group will be there because they need their dogs to lose weight. So it's relevant content. All the question, answers, interactions that happen is going to be relevant to everybody. So we're trying to do group consults of the same group uh, or similar problems so that everything that we discuss within the group uh, consult is relevant to everybody. So we will also be doing a puppy one uh, this month, uh, as in in August. Uh, but the date's not finalized. Uh, the date for weight management group is uh, 14th of August, 9 a.m. So you can go ahead and fill out a form that's on the website. Perfect. That's it, Mansi. Thank you for sharing so many inputs with us about this because this has been a really you know pending issue and i think we will get more questions uh, directed towards us uh, on your instagram on my instagram or on the dog spot live page in the comments and we'll try to address it as and when we see it right yeah we will put this chat up on our uh, instagrams on igtv as well we'll put this video up if you have more questions or you're watching it as a recorded video then just go ahead, ping us the questions, and we'll definitely answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mansi. So I'll just be signing off now. Bye. All right. Thank you, Suti. Thank you. Bye. Bye.